Hello and welcome to the Foreign Press Podcast. I'm Nia Krofi Smatabe. This podcast is an educational program by the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents in the USA, AFPC USA. This episode is developed in partnership with the Heinrich Foundation and with participation from the Pacific Forum. They are available in nearly everything we use daily in this digital age. They are in the electronic device on which you're listening to this podcast and in the cars you drive. You can find them in medical devices and ballistic missiles. I'm talking about semiconductors, also known as microchips. The term semiconductor generally refers to a material that can conduct electricity better than an insulator such as glass, but not as freely as a metal such as copper. Semiconductor materials such as silicon are barely conductive, but they become so when other materials such as phosphorus and antimony are added. The semiconducting capacity is the secret behind the chip's position at the forefront of global trade and geopolitics today. According to the Semiconductor Industry Association, global semiconductor sales in 2022 totaled $574 billion. McKinsey projects the industry will reach a trillion dollars by 2030. The industry, however, is increasingly at the mercy of the largest geopolitical contest in the world. Makers of the world's most advanced chips are based in a handful of countries, though they depend on tens of thousands of components and hundreds of suppliers across the planet. Much of the brain trust for the tech design of advanced chips is American, while much of the market demand for chips as components to assemble final products lies in China. The two superpowers are locked in a battle for global domination on nearly every level, including in the semiconductor space. So, can US allies in the handful of key choke points in the chip supply chain, including Taiwan and the Netherlands, be counted on to keep foregoing trade with China in service of US objectives? And is the industry built for the kind of self-sufficiency that both the US and China appear to want for themselves? Rob York is the Director for Regional Affairs at the Pacific Forum. He and Akhil Ramesh, Director of Economic Statecraft Initiative, also at the Pacific Forum, authored a report on de-risking semiconductor supply chains for our partners at the Heinrich Foundation. We will be discussing their report and the semiconductor industry at large shortly, together with Rob Gordon, Senior Advisor and Managing Legal Counsel at Intel Corporation. Rob Gordon, Rob York, Akhil Ramesh, thank you very much for joining us on the Foreign Press Podcast today. And um, I guess I will start with you, Rob Gordon, because we are talking about semiconductors. And one thing I realized when I was doing my research for this conversation was I thought, you know, because semiconductors is always in the news every day. So I thought I knew a lot about it, but apparently not as much as I probably should know. So one thing we know is that semiconductor chips are in a lot of things that, you know, we use in our daily lives. But really, what exactly are they and uh, what do they do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's funny because we all use technology every day and we take it for granted. But I like to say things that have an on-off switch, nine times out of 10, those things are powered by a semiconductor. Whether it's your Dyson vacuum cleaner, your, uh, you know, microwave, your uh, camera, all types of devices require microchips and processors. I think the one that we're most familiar with, of course, is your laptop. And then, of course, your handheld device, whether it's an iPhone or a Samsung or a Google device. But they're everywhere and they're in your car. And uh, we take it for granted very often. Mm. And um, Rob Yock and Akil, you have done um, some research and have produced a report. And reading through your report, one thing I came across that I just noticed through and through is how semiconductors have become sort of a geopolitical issue, if I can put it as such. And your report also even mentions national security. I'm wondering if these things, are, as Rob Gordon was saying, is in nearly everything that has an on and off switch, then they've been with us for so long. Why are they now suddenly such a geopolitical issue? Well, 
In addition to the pandemic and what that revealed about uh, technology's uses in our in our workplaces and in our daily lives, there's also a new importance to this issue because of cross-strait security. Uh, Taiwan is responsible for more than 60% of uh, semiconductor manufacturing globally and just happens to be what the economist calls the most dangerous place on earth. The People's Republic of China has not promised an invasion you know, by 2027. That's the date people like to throw out there, but it is taking steps and making s- statements that suggest that it's not ruling out that option. Uh, an invasion would have a catastrophic effect on uh, global worldwide semiconductor supply, even if it were repelled. Now, there are other security issues related to Taiwan that semiconductor diversification would not solve, but overall diversification would be a positive development. Okay, and um, Akil, your your report did focus a lot on Southeast Asian countries in the semiconductor space, and I'm wondering, outside of that region and the U.S., which other countries are involved in? the manufacturing end or the um, the value chain or supply chain for semiconductors? That's a great question. Um, so I included Southeast Asia for one part of the supply chain, particularly on the ATP part of it, assembly testing and packaging. So uh, that is the major node in the value chain that the U.S. is trying to fix. Uh, and uh, countries such as Malaysia, for instance, uh, can play a major role because uh, Corporations such as Intel and others have experience working in Southeast Asia. And back when uh, East Asia was starting out in the semiconductor industry, Malaysia already had its own uh, start way ahead of its East Asian peers. But over time, it has remained um, uh, known in the value chain only on the lower end of the value chain. So ATP these days has also become advanced packaging. So in that role, I think Malaysia and other Southeast Asian countries such as Vietnam and others can play a role. Outside Southeast Asia, of course, you have the advanced economies. You have East Asia that is leading in many technological, critical technological fronts like South Korea, Japan, uh, and also Europe. Uh, A lot of semiconductor fabs are being set up in uh, Europe, particularly Germany. And France is also trying to revive manufacturing through its own initiatives. So I think Europe will play a role, so will East Asia, besides Southeast Asia. Though it will be in a very different part of the value chain. So that is the distinction here. Uh, For example, Arizona in the U.S. is trying to revive its manufacturing, uh, also in semiconductors. But what part of the value chain is the distinction? So America already has an advantage in design and manufacturing, which China and uh, emerging markets lag. So the assembly, testing and packaging will remain uh, outside uh, to a larger extent because of the cost competitiveness and also the governments, you know, dialing up industrial policies in these countries, making it an incentive. But uh, yes, many countries can play a role, uh, whether it's emerging markets in Southeast Asia or advanced economies. But are uh, no countries from the global south involved immediately? So uh, countries in the global south, Southeast Asia, uh, there are countries in the global south, South Asia. uh, Sorry, I meant Africa, sorry, specifically, yeah. So Africa can play a role as well. Uh, I think uh, the transition in this supply chain is happening as we speak. Uh, Once it becomes more clear in the next few years, I think there will be a lot more clarity. I mean, even with the industrial policies in America, that they've given a more of a soft deadline of 2029 to see if they work out. They have targets of, you know, reshoring certain percentage by 2029. So I'm thinking of the Inflation Reduction Act and other industrial policies. So similarly, uh, all these major emerging markets have their own industrial policies. Time will tell if they, you know, uh, if they can reap and um, if they don't or if there are alternative markets, uh, say in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think uh, they could play a role, but it's too soon to tell. Okay, so Rob Gordon, Akil talked about design and manufacturing, where the U.S. seems to have dominance. And reading through their report with respect to diversifying the supply chain, I had a hard time understanding why it seems to me from my understanding that the calls persist for a diversified, um, you know, system. But then also the U.S., for instance, appears to want to be a global leader. But I guess I'm learning from what Akil said that currently you're leading in design and manufacturing. Are you, is the U.S.'s goal to be a leader in the entire value chain or just design and manufacturing as it stands now? 
Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good question. So if you look at the three main manufacturers for seven nanometer and below, you basically are dealing with Samsung, TSMC, and Intel, right? And um, Samsung and TSMC, they are bringing facilities and operations to the United States. They've announced that in Texas and in Arizona. So there is uh, some sort of reshoring under the current administration's initiatives happening. Intel is also doing that. We're expanding our existing facilities, but we're also making a massive investment in the state of Ohio, which we're excited about. But you say, where do we want to be uh, sort of, uh, you know, dominant in, I think was your, that it's not really the term I would use, but uh, I think we want to have a significant presence, not only in manufacturing, and design, but we want to also continue with the advanced packaging and the um, which is really moving up the value chain. I think Akil, you made a, a point of this. Uh, it's interesting. Everyone thinks that in order, order to to really have a value play in the semiconductor manufacturing process, you have to have a fab. And that's not the case. The advanced packaging process is extremely critical and important to the entire uh, manufacturing process. And there is extreme value add, and we're seeing that now, um, especially with the, the evolution of the process technology um, as we get towards smaller nodes. So, so there is a lot that can be done. I think what we also noticed, and, and Rob York, you mentioned uh, COVID and some of the supply chain, <laughs> serious supply chain issues that we, we recognized and um, experienced. We can't be solely concentrated in one region, right? We have to diversify. And it does make sense to, to find other sort of hubs. We talked about Eastern Europe. We've got uh, planned operations in Poland and in Germany. Uh, Southeast Asia is a big play for Intel as well in Malaysia and Vietnam. Um, and so we don't have anything yet in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's probably potential opportunity down the road for some of these uh, emerging areas and regions. but Having a diverse supply chain is key and critical to make sure we don't experience some of the shortages and shortfalls that we had during the COVID pandemic. Okay, great. And um, Rob York, in the report under developing domestic semiconductor capacity, um, the report mentions Xi Jinping's 2025 target of reducing China's dependence on foreign technology. And of course, there's been Huawei has been in the news recently uh, with regard to the development of what some are calling a super quantum chip. Based on that, can we say China is then on track to meet this uh, 2025 target that uh, Xi Jinping has for the country? Well, reducing dependency is the objective, and that is so. Therefore, that's the metric it has to be measured against. Uh, it's interesting to note that when they unveiled the Wukong supercomputer, so-called supercomputer, earlier this year, even Chinese scientists acknowledged that they were still quite a bit behind the West in terms of quantum technology. They touted their successes in other fields, but in terms of quantum technology, they recognize they still have a ways to go due to a lack of an industrial foundation. Some of their competitors in the West were the manufacturing computers at a similar level four or five years ago. And today, the, the Osprey, for example, is six times faster than the Wukong. Mm. And uh, Akhil, I don't know if you'd want to add anything to that. Yeah, I would just add one point. Uh, so. This paper we uh, co-authored, Rob and I, was uh, Rob York and I, was part of a, a French shoring series of papers. You know, French shoring different uh, sectors, uh, critical sectors, uh, batteries, uh, semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, and critical minerals. Of the four sectors we studied, semiconductors was the only one that the U.S. had actually advantage. In all other three, China was leading. Uh, in batteries, it's close to, uh, at this stage, impossible for U.S. to take a lead. Uh, in the pharmaceuticals, China basically dominates the APIs, the pharmaceutical ingredients. And the critical minerals, they basically are hegemon in processing. And since they're the vortex of demand, they kind of control the entire market. Uh, if China sneezes, the world will get a pneumonia. That kind of a dynamic they have with critical minerals. Um, so only in semiconductors has the U U.S. have a true advantage, that too in design. And uh, with American companies and our foreign companies, you know, taking part reshoring efforts and also French shoring, uh, there's a possibility that America could retain this advantage. So that is why I think whether China, whether Xi Jinping uh, pushes his uh, you know, state or enterprises and uh, Huawei, that is quasi enterprise into, uh, you know, 
getting their own indig- indigenous uh, chip uh, i think uh, america still has uh, much much more of an advantage than china could ever lead towards okay uh, okay uh, rob gordon do you want to chip in before i ask the next question no i i um i i, I agree with both uh, rob york and akil i i think uh, there are some serious advantages that united states still has especially when it comes to the design process and that is key and that's that's the first step in this whole semiconductor manufacturing process and we still hold that hold that lead okay because once i read that portion of the the report and uh, with the 2025 target and then also based off of Huawei's achievement if i can call it that the question i kept asking was what does it then mean when it comes to the restrictions that the us is trying to you know impose does it mean it's not being effective in a way because Huawei has been able to achieve this feat or what um any anyone can take it um uh, i would partly answer that uh i would add that i uh, recently wrote an article uh, about uh, the latest phone they launched and how uh, you know it has also uh, led to a lot of commotion on you know who supp- supplied the chips and uh, sk hynix is now investigating how one of their chips or their chips were found in the phone so i think in this age we will find a lot of um, cases of um, you know theft or secondary uh, trade happening uh basically there's a market for goods that uh, that can be recycled or they are chips from uh, the secondary market uh, they could access and also enforcing these uh, restrictions is also difficult um over the last few years we've seen that uh, taiwan and korea both have uh, you know pressured washington to give them more you know, leeway with uh, exports because china is a huge market and um uh, both of them have been getting uh, some uh, you know relief from washington's export curbs so in this environment th- there are different loopholes that uh, china could take advantage of and also uh, f- trying to find uh, the source of that small tiny chip where where it's coming from is a difficult task like they said needle in a haystack but more like uh, you know a chip in, in a cargo more like <laughs> that's interesting yeah uh, rob yorky wanted to say something Yes, I was going to say if <clears throat> you mean if by effective you mean stop Chinese technological progress entirely then no sanctions are probably not effective but if you mean slow its technological gains while the US adapts to the fluid security and tech environment in the region then yes these are expected to slow its progress by several years in this front the PRC it should be mentioned is eyeing self sufficiency so it will supply its own domestic markets needs if it achieves its objectives and i think a lot of its neighbors don't necessarily realize this so china is not planning for where it relies on exporters it's planning for a future where it meets its own needs and leaves the rest of us dependent on it for technology we need to send that signal make sure people adapt in advance Also, we're trying to maintain our relative advantage in semiconductors because as our report notes, they have more than just civilian use. Mhm. Yeah. Advanced military ca- um, capabilities and all. Yeah. Indeed. And I think that's where the concern comes in about they gaining access to these advanced um, chip manufacturing systems and all that. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um Akil, you did talk about Korea and trade for instance and your report mentions that that um South Korea which is an ally in this isn't on the same page with the US and indeed some Korean companies have acquired assets of departed American companies in China and South Korean companies according to the report also rely on Chinese market for more than 40% of their sales what exactly are the Koreans selling to the Chinese i was just wondering is it the semiconductor manufacturing equipment or the chip yeah their finished product or what what exactly are they selling so like i mentioned earlier uh, so korea has got some um, i suppose uh, they they are getting a break from the uh, curbs in the sense that uh, both taiwan and korea wanted a uh, little loosening of the export curbs because 40% is a big market for korea and uh, those companies do not want to give it up so easily i don't think any company would want to give up on the chinese market so uh, korea is no exception and since they're an exporting economy uh, they don't want to antagonize 
their biggest market. Uh, they've done it once before with the Todd f- fiasco, uh, deployment of Todd and the backlash that uh, with, you know, restrictions to travel to Korea, to K-pop performances in China. So there's this economic coercion that is a potential. So they don't want to, uh, you know, poke the dragon. So they are also careful, mindful of that. So they're trying to balance their ally uh, America and they're also trying to balance their biggest market. So that act of balancing um, is what you see with South Korea, China and the US. Mm. Okay, and uh, Rob Gordon, I'm going to ask you, it's a two-part question I want to ask. I'll start with you, Rob Gordon, and then I'll go to Rob York. Um, because their, their report noted how the Biden administration has played blow hard, blow cold with its export control measures and notes that if Washington is going to set rules on investing in China and expect other countries to follow them, it must remain consistent. Um, to you, Rob Gordon, I wonder if this um, description of blow hard, blow cold with the control measures worries, um, you know, U.S. manufacturers or U.S. players in the semiconductor industry. So, so what I will say is that, um, you know, we have to be cognizant of what the government, not just our government here in the U.S., but the other governments around the world are doing as far as restrictions, uh, which could make it more difficult for uh, Western companies to do business in China. Um, It's no secret many companies have a large footprint in China, not just a manufacturing footprint, but also a consumer footprint. A a significant amount of uh, revenue from many companies comes from China. And a lot of that revenue is then um, comes back to the United States or to the home country, the host country, you know, the country of, of origin for the company in terms of CapEx spending, in terms of R&D. So there is definitely some benefit derived from those profits that are made overseas. So that's something that we have to balance. Uh, we're continually making sure that we're compliant and that we are within the guidelines of all of the, whether they're guardrails or the uh, export controls that are air, are put in place by the U.S. government. So it is, it's something we deal with and work with all the time. Okay. And uh, Rob York, I'm wondering if you could speak to what you think probably might account for these inconsistencies you talk about in, in the report. I'll start by saying that the past two U.S. administrations, and that's the time frame we're, we're looking at when we talk about this newly uh, skeptical position that uh, the U.S. has had on the PRC, These administrations have had a tightrope to walk in recognizing that there are divergent interests at play for the U.S. and the PRC, especially in the Indo-Pacific region. And these interests concern freedom and openness, especially of sea lanes, but also who sets the rules of international trade. At the same time, outright decoupling is basically impossible, and we don't want to thoroughly disassemble the guardrails that prevent conflict over Taiwan or over the South China Sea immediately. So that's why we saw the Trump administration, for example, reach a phase one trade agreement with the PRC in its last year, even though there were concerns about whether or not the PRC would uphold its end. That's why we've seen officials from the Biden administration travel to China for high level meetings, uh, despite concerns over, for example, spy balloons. That's where these administrations are coming from. The question is, what do we do now that we know that the meetings that this administration has been carrying out have not really demonstrated much reciprocity on the PRC's side? And also that indeed the the PRC did not fulfill its uh, its part of the deal of, of the phase one trade deal, I mean. So does this administration and future ones have the stomach to set a consistent policy of competition that stops short of provoking conflict? We have to keep in mind that, you know, the PRC might make certain statements about its own status as a, as a victim, but also its own status of, uh, as a country that's not willing to use force to achieve its aims. Um, that doesn't mean that conflict is in their interests either. So it doesn't really serve us well to avoid asserting our interests in this case. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, Rob, Rob Gordon, I'll, I'll come to you with this question. Um, I, I read, of course, like I said, when I was preparing, I thought I'd, I knew 
I could say I was almost an expert in semiconductors, but apparently I wasn't. So I came across this report from Deloitte, their 2023 report on the semiconductor industry. Their outlook mentions that the industry is dealing with both shortage and oversupply challenges. And it also mentions that cheap companies are cutting costs, reducing employee headcount and pushing out, but not canceling capital expenditures for additional capacity. And I was wondering, why this is happening of course you're right there in the mix so i was wondering if you could give us some insight yeah so i can't speak to uh to, to, to who they actually uh you know took surveyed as far as the tech companies but i do think we saw a spike during covid right everyone was working from home they were doing at home schooling so there was this big um, hiring spree so to speak by a lot of tech companies they all ramped up and then once people went back to work and things sort of got back to normal, they realized perhaps they had overhired. And so a lot of companies were trimming back, but they weren't trimming back on the CapEx expenditures. They'd simply perhaps overhired in some space. So I think you did see some reductions across the board in all tech sectors and, and, and verticals. We, we were no different in that respect. Um, I think things are starting to get back to normal. Uh, Intel announced earnings yesterday. We had a strong quarter. Things are looking positive. Um, so I do think think that um, you're going to see a, a, a return to normal, <laughs> but what that new normal looks like, we're still trying to figure out. Okay. All right. Good to know. And uh, this question I will throw to all three of you, uh, because it, it's just a summary of um, Deloitte's report where they are saying that their report anticipates that 2023 could act as the pause that refreshes and allows the semiconductor industry to conduct five big things. And they list them but the one that stuck out for me was that they said um it it could digitally transform and digitize many parts of the process i.e financial planning and operations order management and supply chain and i wanted to find out if you agree or disagree starting with um akil so uh, i can't speak to the financial planning and operations because uh, i'm not part of the industry exactly but uh from the supply chain perspective uh, uh 2023 yes uh so that is as it is digitization across spheres across sectors and the semiconductors would probably be the leading sector that engages in this okay um rob yuck yes as mr gordon intimated it was one thing to, to turn a profit in these sectors when they were very much in demand during the work from home phase but there's definitely been a reason to rethink just look at the stock prices for netflix and disney plus so yes there's definitely this is definitely a good year i guess you would say to to rethink certain aspects of the business and including the digitization of many parts of the process Mm. And uh, Rob Gordon. I agree, but I do think where you're going to see a, a, a huge um, some sort of spike, perhaps, is you're in the in the digitalization of the artificial intelligence applications and programs. Look at what OpenAI has done with ChatGPT. It hasn't even been out on the market commercially for a year yet. I think it hits a year in November. And look what it's done to the entire world. Um, so, so I think that I also think with that comes the the CSPs, right? The cloud service providers, and look at what's what's going to happen with data centers and online data transactions. So I do think that in 2024 you're going to see some significant changes there as well. But I don't know that we're going to everyone's going to rush out and, you know, stockpile, you know, all their goods and, and technological needs for another pandemic. Fingers crossed that won't happen. And we saw that spike. And I think we're all pretty much set with our home office for the time being. But I think AI is going to really change a lot of that moving forward. But the one thing I was surprised I didn't see uh, in, well, I, I didn't see in the summary was that the semiconductor industry, Rob, you're going to kill your report mentioned that it estimates that up to 10 million gallons of water a day can be used by a large chip fab, which is roughly water for 300,000 households. I was wondering, I was hoping to see something about that in the transformation of for the five things that were supposed to be mentioned uh, about the industry, but I didn't see that. And I was wondering if this is something that industry should be looking at is looking at or will look at you know the amount of water that goes in into the processing or manufacturing so i would think 
So I'll just jump in real quick and let the other two experts opine on this, but um, sustainability is a huge focus area, right? We want to make sure that we're, um, you know, doing good towards the environment and that we're net positive on water usage, that we've got incredible recycling programs in place when it comes to water usage, because yes, uh, semiconductor manufacturing is extremely water intensive. And so we have made some very conscious efforts and we've got some state of the art operations in places like Arizona and New Mexico and others where water is, is a scarce resource but that is definitely a focus area for companies like us and we and we take it seriously and we've done some amazing things in that regard that's good to know yeah um rob and uh Kiel? sure um so i was in arizona a couple of months ago um, and uh, i met with all the stakeholders in the value chain i met with uh, the manufacturers i met with the local government i met with the journalists environmentalists uh, and so on um so uh one of the recurring themes was uh, the issues rather in Arizona was actually two. Uh, one uh, was around uh, labor and u- unions. The other one was uh, the environment, water usage. So with the labor, I think there's more of a it changes with the market, changes with the region. But water usage uh, has been a challenge around the world. Uh, Taiwan has had some serious water issues. Um, Arizona, one might think a desert, Arizona, Texas uh, will have issues, but not all cities in Arizona. That's the other thing I found. Um, different cities have different uh, water uh, issues. Uh, so it uh, depends on which city they are in. Uh, and also the recycling practices. Uh, so different companies uh, from different countries operate differently. Also, I should note different companies have different levels of transparency on these policies. Not every company proudly boasts that we recycle so many or this is our policy or they don't invite us in to give, give that information. That was the snippet I got from a journalist um, who was comparing uh, different uh, chip manufacturers. And uh, they said, uh, you know, uh, some countries like, for example, Intel, like Rob Garden put it, yes, uh, Intel is, has a good reputation with journalists. But I can't, dis- I can't say the same about uh, all chip manufacturers. So there is this concern that transparency is an issue. So uh, if transparency is an issue, then you actually don't have data on the water usage by the organization and also what is recycled and so on. So uh, I think as ESG takes center stage uh, in discussions, not just uh, among activists and environmentalists, but also in the boardroom, you will have uh, more questions raised on water usage and semiconductors. Hmm. Okay, and uh, Rob York? I don't think I have a lot to add to what these gentlemen have said. Uh, I'm sure that uh, companies involved in semiconductor manufacturing and who have ambitions for expansion, including on U.S. soil, are are looking at this issue very closely. I will say that uh, it's not an issue in the U.S. alone. Taiwan has also had its issues with uh, water shortages recently. So this is an issue where I know Arizona has water cooperation water sharing arrangements as well due to its natural climate so water sharing is probably going to be necessary in, in the near future at least until we find another way to make these things all right great and i um i want to thank you gentlemen but before we close i was just wondering if i could just pick your brains briefly um for rob rob york and akil what um you well 2023 is almost coming to an end I'm, so what are you what are your expectations for the industry in uh, the next year 2024 and for you rob gordon since you're a player what should we expect from the industry in 2024 um should we go what should we expect or should we go with who what to okay i'll leave it to you guys to go first so <laughs> okay rob yeah rob gordon okay Sure. So I think, I mean, you know, from my perspective, I think we're going to see some great advanced innovative products. Like I said, artificial intelligence is the next wave. So watch out. It's coming. It's already here. But I do think areas of focus, I think supply chains are going to continue to be extremely important. And I would focus that narrowly on critical minerals. And I would also say the other issue that Um, And it's not just semiconductor, but U.S. uh, manufacturing has a skilled labor. We need to work on that workforce development aspect. And it's not just in the United States that we need to focus on STEM and and STEM research. It's all over the globe. You look at Japan, where they are in their digital readiness and their workforce skilling. They've they've, they've got some some heavy um, 
issues they need to deal with when it comes to to their workforce. We're dealing with an aging population around the world. We need skilled laborers, and we we need the the the, uh, the design engineers, but we also need the the tradesmen that can actually pour the concrete and put the steel and weld to build these factories. Great, thank you, uh, uh, Rob Gordon, uh, Michael, Rob York. Sure. Uh, okay. So. I- yeah, I would say I, I agree with uh, Rob Gordon on the critical minerals aspect of it. I mean, just last week we had the news about graphite. Um, so China could always weaponize uh, its dominance in critical minerals. But as for the semiconductor space, um, I think it's going to get more interesting um, because the competition could heat up. Um, you know, we, we've uh, got the, this year we got the news about Huawei's new phone. Uh, next year, just the way people wait outside uh, by an Apple store, I think there'll be people waiting for the next Huawei uh, phone, and uh, that could be bigger news as well. Um, so I'm not uh, saying it, there is going to be something big, but uh, uh, Ch- China is not going to introduce its military capacity publicly, but it's going to introduce its civilian uh, mobile phone capacity. I think that is one way of uh, it showing off its in- indigenization. So that, that'll raise more questions and also on the success of industrial policies, because uh, as we see it, next year is also election year. Um, yeah. So when you dole out uh, industrial policy subsidies, uh, there's there are questions asked. And some industrial policies like the IRA were partisan. So next year, we will also find out if industrial policies work, uh, if news such as that comes out, and also if economic statecraft, the sanctions and um, uh, you know, other measures work. So I think that will be also a topic of discussion in, in politics and elections. Great. And uh, finally, Rob York. It's going to be necessary for the private sector to lead the way and for the policy community such as ourselves to be outspoken about what the needs are for the economy, but also for national security, because it does not appear that our government dysfunction is going to get any better in the meantime. Okay, so Rob York, who we just heard, Akhil Ramesh, and Rob Gordon. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time with us today on the Foreign Press Podcast. Thank you. That's it for this episode of the Foreign Press Podcast, developed in partnership with the Heinrich Foundation and with participation from the Pacific Forum. Visit our website, www.foreignpresscorrespondence.org, for more educational resources produced by the AFPC USA. And check out our dedicated press freedom platform. The address is www.pressfreedom.org for updates on global press freedom violations. You can always follow us on social media. Find us at Foreign Press USA. And if you haven't subscribed to this podcast yet, make sure to hit the follow or subscribe button wherever you are listening. I hope you join us again next time for another episode of the Foreign Press Podcast. I'm Nia Krofi Smatabe.